space. It's the KTM Summer Grill here on the Speed Cafe website. In June of 2023, Motorsport Australia announced that its then CEO, Eugene Arocca, would be retiring from the post, having been in it since 2012. The person who's taking over the role has a very hands-on connection with the sport, having been both a competitor and some great business now that he brings to the position as well. We are going to spend a bit of time catching up and getting to know Sunil Vora a little bit better. Welcome to the Speed Cafe Summer Grill. It's great to see you. Thanks very much, Rusty. Really nice to be here. Nice to join you. How have you found things so far? Look, it's been a, a lovely, warm welcome into the sport. I think, as people know, I've been in and around the sport for, for some years, but on the other side as a spectator and as a fan and, and somebody who just went to events, but also competed a little bit myself in and around sort of state level racing. So I've, I've known of the sport and of people and, and structures within the sport for quite a long time, but to be able to come in and just be part of really this warm welcome I've received from everybody in and around the sport has meant these sort of first few weeks have been really enjoyable for me. It's been great to live and breathe motorsport every day from inside the tent and it's a really interesting, you know, broad, diverse field to get across. So, you know, my first my first few weeks have been really enjoyable. Just so Neil, just tell us we've you know, you've got a bit of a business background. Can you just tell us the Snil Vora story and, you know, where you've been and then what brought you to this motorsport Australia role? Yeah, happy to. If I, if I sort of characterise it in um, in a couple of ways, I guess, in terms of my commercial experience. Firstly, I'm I'm speaking to you from Melbourne. I originally grew up in Melbourne, um, and but I did spend a long time overseas. So I think you know the the big buckets of my career have been one is in and around senior leadership roles in ASX 200 organisations. I've been either a chief operating officer or a chief executive officer. Um, in a corporatized structure, and that's been within an insurance and risk management setting. So a lot of insurance and risk type experience and a lot of experience around people risk specifically. There's a whole industry around people risk insurance and the way that that works is is really focused on risk prevention. So I spent a lot of time in that world and and operating around organizations that have quite, you know, worth quite a lot of money, have high revenue streams, uh, and very strict governance structures around how they operate. And so that's been sort of one tranche of my professional experience. And the other part has been around management consulting and strategic delivery. I've had my own management consultancy business here in Australia and also in the UK where I spent a lot of time. I lived there for 13 years uh, studying and working. Uh, and uh, I was running a pretty successful management consulting business over there, working with a lot of organisations about strategic delivery, how to take a good strategic plan signed off by a board, but then how do you organise yourself as an organisation to be able to deliver against that, realise the benefits, manage risk in doing so, utilise your resources effectively, those types of things. And I think all of that really just brings a level of experience and some skills and just some knowledge about how organisations might address these things, might look to tackle some of these challenges. So I think those are the sort of things that that background has been appealing coming into a motorsport setting. And obviously my general love and passion of the sport is clearly something that um, that is a bit of appeal to the Motorsport Australia board when they were thinking about who could be good for this role and who might have a sort of good weighting of skills and experience. And just that I bring that same passion that I think everybody in and around the sport has. It's the thing that binds everybody. I think that's something that uh, has been of value and is a big part of my own story and what I bring to the table, and that I also have a you know a competitor's mindset, um, the competitor experience, somebody who's got seat time in and around grassroots motorsport. I think just adds to you know the the, the weight of considerations that you bring to the table. So I think all those things sort of added up to a background that was relatively suited for the role, and when you know it was offered to me. As to whether I wanted to take it on, uh, I think it's this, one of those times in your life when you think you just can't walk past the opportunity. So I was really keen uh, to put my hand up and say, yes, I wanted to do it um, and I wanted to, to really commit myself to the role. And I certainly isn't something I regret. It's been a great experience so far. And hopefully we'll see some of my experience you know, come to bear and actually be a benefit to the sport for the long term. 
you're in that unique and rare position of being able to blend passion and occupation, which is terrific. How, how different is the business perhaps to other businesses that you've been involved in in the past? And is it a case of, you know, a fresh set of eyes from the, the, um, the, the other work that you've done, the other companies that you've been a part of that can perhaps benefit our code? Look, I think it's not actually remarkably different from what I expected coming into Motorsport Australia. Uh, even though my engagement with the organisation had been relatively limited as a, as a licence holder previously, but I think some of the themes and some of the issues that Motorsport Australia has are, are common amongst many organisations, and particularly not-for-profit organisations that are seeking to continue to evolve and improve and do more. Uh, and you're always uh, you know, to some extent constrained by the resources you have available, the size of the balance sheet and the p and and the financial structure means there's a there's a finite amount of things can be deployed or can be done at any given moment. And there's many organisations that I've worked with that have a similar context and a similar experience. And so it's about, I think for me, it's about what are the frameworks or what are the, the ways that you make smart decisions about what you choose to do and have the discipline to say, well, we're not going to try and do everything and do a lot of things to an average level level we're going to do a few things well and they're going to be clearly quite well aligned to the strategic plan of the organization so i think i've been really pleased to see the organizations already in that mindset and i think the thing that i also really value is um, a, a very uh, well established board that's operating well with high caliber directors who are very aligned and uh, looking to drive a clear message through to myself and the executive team about what are the important plays that we need to make uh, as an organisation for the for the betterment of the sport? You know, we're not serving shareholders, we're not serving you know private structure. This is really about what are the steps we take to improve things for the sport overall. And I think to answer the other part of your question, Rusty, in terms of a fresh set of eyes, I think that it has been valuable. I think it has been in these early days, um, and hopefully I'm you know on the right path with as I look at things and I go well, why do we take that view? Why do we do things this way? Why have we made those set of decisions? Could we think about it another way? Uh, and just bringing a bit of a bit of intel and a bit of experience. But the, the fresh perspective is valuable. Hopefully it, it lasts for a while and it's not something that I quickly, um, quickly lose because I think it's been valuable early on and I think the organisation overall is responding really well to it. So what is uh, what is motorsport australia doing well at the moment and, and what are you looking at as areas to to improve or to to make changes well i think it's a it's a broad series of things that have been done well i think obviously it's a it's a it's a it's a complex sport and therefore motorsport australia works <clears throat> excuse me works across a lot of areas in terms of the ability to uh manage and run you know as a as a as an asn on behalf of the fia a series of competition rules about how we run our, our our accredited events, how they're stewarded, how they're supported, and how our license holders then come and, and compete and across what terms. I think these are things we do well. I think there's a huge amount of experience within the organisation, what you might call corporate intel, as well as you know structures and ways of working about how we just go about event execution. I think these are things that you know we've got a, a great weight of capability in. I think also the thing that is perhaps newer but clearly an evolving and emerging part is the way that we actually take ownership of certain events and promote provide the media services for those. Um, I think those are things that increasingly are becoming a core part of the capabilities of the organisation because these are great assets for the sport and for the organisation overall. And often we find that, you know, those are great ways to continue to grow and achieve our strategic ambitions around improve participation, uh, more number of events, more book taking part. These are all key things that we want to drive. So I think there's a lot of things that we've done well. Traditionally, there's things that we're improving on. And I think clearly, if you know, we sort of lean into some of the areas that have been problematic in recent times. I think clearly we think about a sport that has an inherent level of risk associated with it, personal risk in terms of a number of stakeholders. You know, it's not just competitors. This isn't like, you know, if you're, if you're playing AFL football, for example, the likelihood is the only person you're going to hurt is yourself uh, if you might do a hamstring or something like that. Uh, whereas in our sport, we, we have to think about a number of, of areas around risk about participants and competitors, but also the people around uh, an event, volunteers, marshals, spectators, uh, any number of different people can be involved in incidents. And so we think about risk and safety across all of those areas. And I think clearly, you know, we've been through a period where 
perhaps in some areas we haven't quite got the balance right around risk and safety versus the ability to let you know events run in a way that they otherwise traditionally have done so or are evolving to do so I think that's an area that we will continue to focus on obviously I'm deeply interested in that given my background and I'm keen to see you know what I can do to bring additional skills and additional perspectives so that we can just adhere to what we want to do which is more often people go about enjoying the fantastic sport that is motorsport and they get to go home safely and we've all had a great time we've been on the right side of that you know, risk and safety balance, because uh, we do that every time we go out and compete. We want to make sure that people go home safely at the end of the day. Sunil, can I take that word balance that you you uh, used there a moment ago and, and apply it to, I mean, you talked about a couple of um, uh, key assets or pillars there in, in uh, Australian Rally Championship, in Speed Series, in, in some major codes, and they're, they're huge um, for... Uh, showing our constituents what what you're capable of, but I also sense in you. Correct me if I'm wrong here. That there is a very strong commitment, an ongoing commitment at grassroots level. Is that is that a fair statement too? Uh, unequivocally, Rusty. I think um, I couldn't speak um, you know more strongly and more confidently about our commitment to grassroots motorsport. And I think clearly, given my incredibly strong connection to grassroots mm. motorsport and my absolute passion for it, I, I could advocate all day as to why grassroots motorsport is where everybody needs to be and because the experience is is one that is just fantastic for everyone that's involved the the fun the enjoyment the camaraderie the support um that you experience or the certainly that i've experienced at grassroots motorsport has been unmatched anywhere across you know my professional or personal life um you can't find this in other areas the way that you are supported and the thing that binds us around um, our love of motorsport at grassroots is almost, um, it's almost the best platform to, to exhibit that and demonstrate it. So a clear focus for Motorsport Australia as an organisation, the way we're structured, the way our uh, revenue structure works, the way our licence holders work, the way that we go about organising ourselves, all has a weighting to grassroots motorsport. Um, and particularly for me, uh, it's obviously a key area of focus and improvement. And it's an area that we can, you know, utilise to deliver against our objectives. You know, one of our, our core pillars of our strategic plan is to be able to grow participation across all facets of motorsport, whether that's participation or volunteers or even uh, spectators. All of these things can be achieved really well in grassroots. So uh, certainly um, my focus and the organisation's focus is very strongly about how we continue to support grassroots motorsport and we are structured that way through our state councils and our state structures um, leading up to the national um, motorsport australia board so uh, i think people um, will continue to see that continue to feel it and certainly um, it's a thing that i will speak about a lot i think in 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 my in my time and in my efforts will be about how to further support grassroots you just touched on the strategic plan and another one of the points in that was about um Securing and improving access to facilities, obviously that's um, a particularly important topic for the grassroots and there's a perception that we don't really have a lot of racetracks these days and you know, the Wakefield Park example shows how quickly they can be taken away. Thankfully that's uh, on track to be reopened. What, what does Motorsport Australia need to do or what is it doing to help secure that access and to promote better facilities for participants? Yeah, look, I think there's um, there's a big theme there around um, access to facilities, and that applies across you know all disciplines of motorsport. You know, whether it's rally or circuit based, hill climb, whatever. I think these are all things that we are conscious of and we think about. Um, and I think we're also um, and, and implicit within our strategic plan is being able to land a template around facilities that have some greater level of ownership and control. So the key part of that in the strategic plan for motorsport Australia is called the home of motorsport, which is currently targeted around a feasibility study in the western suburbs of Melbourne and Avalon next to Avalon Airport in that sort of growth corridor, still accessible to the city of Melbourne, but within an area that um, isn't necessarily as under threat uh, to other land usages that you know, some of the existing and traditional facilities um, have been or will you know, potentially, um, potentially suffer from. So the home of motorsport is a key initiative for us to drive through into the end of this year and into January around feasibility going into 
then into the Victorian state government um, treasury process around a business case that says, if we were to, if the government was to invest a certain amount of money, we'd be able to build dedicated track facilities that could counter for a number of dis different disciplines. And those facilities would be um, controlled and managed by Motorsport Australia rather than a private operator. Because currently, if we go to look to deploy motorsport at a circuit, they're generally privately held, there needs to be you know, significant fees paid in order to do that. And we only have limited access often in terms of how we can go and do that. Whereas with a dedicated home of motorsport, if we can stand that up, if we can build that, it gives us a multiple options about how to run different events there, the different categories of events, but also we can bring a number of capabilities to that facility, like being able to run uh, STEM related subject training and educational activities, potential for university and higher education to potentially be based at part of the facility for us to do a lot of early learning training and license training. There's a number of different things that we can bring to a facility that we had control over. And if we are successful in doing that, it also gives us a template in, in order to be able to engage with councils and governments um, at state and local levels to go, here's what we can do, here's the benefits to the local community, to the sport overall, to participation, for it to be seen as one of these key infrastructure and architectural investment in growing communities, not just a cost for a sport that doesn't necessarily translate to benefits. I think we've got to be smarter than that. We've got to be able to articulate the benefit because we know there is a substantive economic benefit to this type of investment. And it's a way of also future-proofing and sustaining the sport for the long term when we have more of these types of infrastructure and we're not necessarily reliant on uh, sites and facilities that we don't control or potentially, as you, as you rightly note, are under threat because the land is coveted for other reasons. So I, I guess what I'm taking from this is, you know, and you mentioned promoting events before, so there is a view that Motorsport Australia was or should be just a regulatory body. You're saying that, what well, you're saying that Motorsport Australia adds value by, you know, being more involved in operationalising all these things and, and actually, you know, for example, managing tracks itself or, you know, promoting events itself? Well, I think a lot of these things fall under the banner of sustainability, which is a key aspect of, and a key deliverable on our strategic plan and will be for future strategic plans. The current one we're working is a, is a three-year plan. This is the first year in 23. We're just coming to the end of it. We've got 24 and 25. One of the key pillars talks to sustainability of the, of the sport in participation, financially, environmentally, all of these notions of sustainability. And I think, and we've seen this, you know, prior to, to me arriving, Motorsport Australia has a role in driving sustainability of the sport and providing the formats and structures where growth can occur economic activity can occur, but we can start to bring in some of the things around you know, environmental sustainability and the like. So I think there is a role. We've already seen that play out. We've seen, for example, the speed series grow significantly over the last few years and become, you know, in, and the news into 2024 is very exciting about how it will grow, how it will be accessed, the categories and formats that run. I think we've, we've shown that this is something Motorsport Australia can do and can do well. And I think it's all part of driving further growth in the sport and adding value to the sport rather than just being seen purely as a regulator. We have a number of different hats, as many you know, regulatory bodies in sport in Australia do. They don't just play one hat. Uh, so I think that's something we've shown we can do quite well. Sunil, we're talking to you at, at a time where it's uh, relatively recent that you've taken uh, the reins of the, of the job there. When we get you back on for the summer grill in 12 months' time, what are the kind of couple of wish list things that we hope you can have, you know, have achieved in that period? Oscar Piastri on the podium at uh, Albert Park clearly is one of them. Uh, hopefully with the win, um, given, yes. uh, given the upward trajectory of Oscar and that McLaren, um, it's, it would be a, a great story, wouldn't it? Uh, and then clearly the AGP is something we're, we're really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to, to going to my first, obviously, inside the organisation, having been many, many times in the past as a spectator. Um, it would be great to be, be a part of it. I think there's a, there's a few things other than seeing you know, the trajectory of Australians on the international stage continue to prosper. I think I'd like to see participation numbers growing for that next year to come through. We look at the, the, at the national level and you know, up into, into supercars, you see the talent coming through the organisations and through the categories from juniors all the way through to the, 
the top tier of the sport. I think we want to see more of that. I think we want to see how much we can continue to encourage and provide facilities and structures for people to successfully um, you know, navigate those pathways and for Motorsport Australia to be seen as supporting that. I think the big deliverable for us in the next 12 months is to see if we can, as we've just spoken about, see if we can actually land the funding for the home of motorsport and actually move to a construction phase. I'd love to be sitting here in 12 months' time talking to you about how that's going and how much we're looking forward to the layout of the circuit, what sort of categories will run there, what sort of timings we're looking at, at, at standing this up and actually being live to the sport. I think these will be you know, extraordinary things to talk about. And the other thing I think I'd probably like to be talking to you about more is about sustainability and more is about particularly when we talk about participation under a sustainability umbrella, I think there's more and more the opportunity for motorsport to be a natural home for a wide range of people, not just um, from a gender perspective, not just males and not just people you know, attached to motorsport families. I think increasingly we see there's a huge amount of opportunity for uh, boys and girls to come into the sport. I was just part of the Girls on Track um, uh, activities at to the Adelaide 500 just over a week ago and seeing 105 girls arrive with fantastic passion and excitement for motorsport and having a structure for them to engage with about how they can move forward in their education and then ultimately their employment to become part of motorsport and become part of the motorsport family. I think it was incredibly um, inspiring to see, incredibly encouraging and really pleasing to see that those pathways and that structure exists. So I'd like for us to really scale these activities so that motorsport becomes a natural home for people to want to come to when they're thinking about what are the community sports they get involved in, starts at grassroots, it goes into perhaps more significant activity at a state and a national level. Um, so those are the sort of things you know I'd love to talk about for us around participation, sustainability. And the last thing I think is for us to start to be clearer about our environmental footprint, to start to baseline that and for us to be talking to you about um, activities and initiatives that start to net back some of those emissions that we aim for us to be able to measure that effectively. I think there's a key plays that are going on in global motorsport. I'd love for that to be part of what we're doing here in Australia and for us to be able to, to really settle on what are the right metrics, what are the mechanisms that we use to be able to measure um, progress against our objectives and for us to just put that all under the banner of being you know, good community citizens and part of a, a global community that's really conscious of our carbon footprint and we're taking active steps to to abate that so hopefully in 12 months we're covering all those areas and we've got some pretty good stories around each of them congratulations on the top job thank you very much for talking to us over the the festive period and we wish you and the team there all the very best for 2024 that's very kind thank you look forward to speaking again thanks very much there he is, Sunil Vora, the CEO of Motorsport Australia. Good to stop and talk a little bit about the administrative side of the sport and some of the great things that they have planned for next year and beyond. Make sure you tune back into the Speed Cafe website tomorrow morning to see who our next guest is here on the KTM Summer Grill. You could be a winner each episode of the Summer Grill. KTM are giving you the chance to win a bar stool, a mug, and this race-inspired clock as well. So there's more good reasons to tune in and hear from some of the stars of world motorsport here as a part of the KTM Summer Grill. All you gotta do is click on the link below, fill in your details, and you could be in the running to win.